Are you a business owner looking for real advice and input? You're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Tom Connor, who will be sitting in for Matt Watson today because Matt Watson is having a baby. Tom, what's up? <laughs> Not much. Hi, Matt. Long no, time. No, pr- no pressure there. You're competing with a newborn child I, I, for as far as the listeners are concerned. Well, hopefully his, his wife's having a baby. But these days, I, I understand. You have the baby together. You together. Have it together. We are pregnant. Yeah. We had the baby. Yes. He is, yeah, I've been trying to. Never. I've trying to get been trying to get my wife to buy into that for a long time, and she just kind of looks at me with that kind of side eye, and she's like, <laughs> "Yeah, you really did all the work there." <laughs> well, Tom, welcome to Start a Puzzle, and you got a lot to talk about, and you know, we'll just get this out of the way. I've known you since high school, and haven't talked to you since maybe the early nineties. <laughs> yeah, most likely. <laughs> And so, so I, I appreciate you reaching out and you've, you've found quite a bit of success out in Silicon Valley. And today we're going to talk about all kinds of 3D stuff, which as the co-founder of 3D Source, which those of you that are listening, you know, I like it when you're interactive. So go to 3dsource.com. And while you're on the internet, you can also go over to fullscale.io, learn about the sponsor of today's episode who can help you build a software team quickly and affordably. So anyway, man, welcome back. And it's good to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be speaking to, uh, to my roots in Kansas. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So, you know, I, I, have told everyone we're getting into 3d stuff, but I'd like to, you know, we like to start episodes with a little bit of backstory and if you could give us a little bit of background, I mean, even about yourself or 3d source and, you know, let us know a little bit about your business and maybe that what got you into it and what kind of problem you solved. You bet. Yeah. So I've been doing software since I knew you, uh, believe it or not. Uh, if you ever went to Oak park mall back in 1992, and went under the stairs, uh, you know, past music land and under the stairs, you would have found me at a place called Babbage's selling video games and software and wearing a tie. And uh, way before tech and software was uh, was cool. So Back it's kind of, floppy disks were still floppy for some. Well, people. yeah. Do you want what it, well, you want to buy that uh, Baldur's Gate? Do you want it in five and a quarter or, or three and a half disks? You know. Uh, that we just was, showed everyone how old we are. That's the whole deal. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I've always been in software. I mean, I transitioned from mowing lawns to basically doing that at the mall. And um, uh, from there, I did work in uh, out of college. Uh, I worked in uh, a multiple listing service company. So uh, all the homes for sale, uh, we would go out to small and medium size board of realtors and I'd set up a SCO Unix system and teach them how to use it and then teach all the real estate agents how to use their brand new laptops, which were a new thing. And then many of them would come up to me afterwards and say, well, that was just great, uh, but uh, I'm retiring because uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into these computers and stuff. So I've seen these sort of waves of, of technology. And while I was traveling, uh, I think by the time I was 25, I've been to all but two states uh, in the U.S. Just traveling around as a young young kid out of uh, out of Kansas City. Um, I was obviously out in California quite a bit, and just said, "Boy, there's there's a lot going on, and I'm in computers, and so I should uh, take it out there." So, um, spent time at a few startups. Um, some shut down completely. Some got sold, and me with it. Uh, a lot of different experiences with that and, you know, learned, learned a ton through failures as, as you did learn to kind of trust my instincts on things uh, and not necessarily be impressed that someone had worked at Net, uh, Netscape or something like that from back in the day. Um, like, Hey, that, that, that means something now, but it might not tomorrow uh, sort of stuff. So after all that, I, I jumped into a position at Autodesk. And actually, one of the CTOs that had been there for a long time uh, initially hired me and just had an awesome experience bouncing around from different divisions that were not their core product, always kind of outside on the fringe. So cloud services back when those were called ASP 
uh, application service providers and things like that. And I got into the consumer group and consulting and uh, lots of really cool um, stories and things like that, but largely bringing 3D technology uh, to places where it, it didn't exist. So like maybe most notable uh, around the time of the last uh, financial crisis, I, I had a, a official badge and access to Starbucks headquarters in Seattle, uh, where I was leading a team to convert them from two-dimensional floor plans for store development and store design uh, into 3D. So they could think about that theater of when you walk in and you see the barista over the, uh, the brewing machine and have that eye contact and all of that kind of stuff that uh, Howard, Howard Schultz uh, was very, very much uh, trying to design into the stores that 3D really unlocked the power of. Um, and building all the parts and pieces so that people could just drag and drop a 3D Starbucks store rather than thinking about drawing arcs, lines, and circles. So I've seen 3D sort of progress uh, on the professional side and eventually just said, well, there's, there's a lot going on there, but what's really underserved is the capability that it brings to marketing and visualizing products. So for, for old guys like you and I, we remember 3D when you still had the red and the blue glasses, maybe, um, while we might have been kids when some of that stuff came out. Obviously, 3D has gone through a renaissance. Um, it never really, it, it doesn't really seem to have caught on with the flat panel TV and the home use. I know some people are into, it, into that, but I mean, yeah. I, I tried it at one point and I was like, I don't like wearing these goofy glasses. But the, the 3D that you're talking about and what you guys do at 3D Source, and once again, for those of you listening, go to 3dsource.com. You can see they got a lot of cool stuff there. You're using it in, in a completely different kind of way than a lot of people would at first envision 3D, which is like a screen and something popping out of it. So right. you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about that evolution and like, what's the, I mean, what's the difference between what you guys do and the LCD version that, that didn't catch on? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, in fact, like like you mentioned, I mean, people actually see 3D images every single day and have no idea uh, that it was computer generated, right? So 3D is sort of broad. You know, see, we hear CGI, right, VFX, things like that around movies and entertainment, and we're talking generally about the same thing. And Autodesk, where I used to work, is the company that makes the software that people use to create that stuff. So whether it's uh, you know, a marble special effect or uh, or a architectural building rendering, they're using the software that Autodesk ma makes to make uh, those sorts of assets, right? But I think the best example of all of this and, and really fits into what we do is IKEA. So when I worked at Autodesk, um, well, back, I think starting in 2006, they began a process of leveraging 3D rendering for their product visualization. So someone at uh, Ikea created a, a 3D chair uh, and then slid that into a stack of proofs of photography uh, at Ikea that was going to go to catalog uh, and the website. And it went by the product owner, the person signing off on the images, and they said, great, um, looks good, right? So it passed the sort of... Uh, the uncanny valley that 3D can often have that, hey, that looks fake, that looks like a cartoon. Um, and so off they went and they've spent over a decade now and millions of dollars uh, such that when you look at an Ikea catalog or you look at an Ikea you know, item on a website, that is that was not created by someone snapping a photo of an object sitting in a photo studio. That is a 3D rendering, uh, all produced within a computer. Uh, and the advantages of doing that are multiple, right? Especially for a company as broad as them, trying to serve 64 different markets or something. Um, they can, they, they have ultimate capability of making a really consistent looking image. Um, they don't have to set up the lights in the exact same spot every time. Um, when they're doing a, a lifestyle shot, like a kitchen, uh, they, can, they can create the kitchen, uh, put in a US size dishwasher, uh, and take a nice shot of their cabinets. But then when they want it for the Japanese market, they don't have the big wide uh, US size dishwasher. Digitally, they insert the narrow one that's more popular in Japan, maybe swap out the dish soap on the counter and the lighting stays perfect beaming in from the window and you've got your shot. So massive cost savings and efficiencies 
And that's the type of 3D we do is, is photography replacement um, to gain all kinds of, uh, of kind of bottom line savings, but also marketing faster, all that to get top line as well. So you guys have been doing this since 2016, which, you know, it depends on what industry you're in. That might not sound like a long time. I would imagine for this, that's ancient. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, in some ways we were, we're too early and I mean, we talk about COVID, but you know, this has made sense for a lot of industries for a long time, but it's funny when you sell a product that no one knows anyone's looking at, right? I have to rely on telling that Ikea story for anyone to know that that's what they're seeing. And that perhaps even though they're in automotive filters, that they should be doing the same thing, right? Or at least understanding that space of why are we taking a photograph? And if we have a configurable product uh, that we can make in lots of different ways, but we can't photograph it. We should be exploring this space. So, and I find this to be really interesting for, I, and I think the Ikea story was a great background because I didn't realize that I just assumed that when I see these 3d pictures and by the way, the one that, that I, so I have a sneaker problem like shoes oh, yeah. and the StockX app is really good at, at 3d renderings of shoes. And I've always enjoyed that. And I, I never for a moment thought that that might not be a circular picture. I mean, maybe that is, maybe it isn't, but, but I think overall, like that, the whole, the, I mean, this is the future of not only marketing, but kind of getting your shit together in yeah. a lot of ways. And I say that in so loosely because I mean, how many times have you ordered something and you're like, man, I wish I would have known it looked like that. Or Absolutely. I wish I would have known that it looked like this. Now we, we had a prior guest, a guy named Joel Tepley, who works for Cambrian Tech and they do a lot of computer vision stuff and uh, they, they provide some of the technology behind paint apps to like try to, and I, I just never had given any consideration. You know, he starts talking about neural networks and all this crazy stuff. And I'm <laughs> like, man, I just thought you were making the wall blue. And, you know, I, and I didn't, and I didn't until, until we recorded that episode, I didn't realize how complex a lot of this stuff was. Cause overall, like you mentioned selling computers at Babbage's and us joking about being around floppy disks when they're still floppy. Well, th that world was very two dimensional and yeah. computers don't see things in 3d the way yeah. that we do. And I never had given much consideration to the complexity of the human mind. And, you know, maybe that's just me not being deep enough, but you know, I think this is really cool. Now I didn't realize that it was like emulating the rest of an object in some sort. So now are you guys able to take a picture and then begin to make assumptions or do you, do you patch them together or like, give us a little, like, I mean, you don't yeah. have to give us the keys to the castle, but background. I mean, how does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Um, to produce a really good 3D model, there's a few different approaches, but really the best one is through a 3D artist. So somebody who okay. understands the software. And it, like I said, it's literally the same software uh, that people are using to create video games and uh, visual effects for Hollywood. And so that's why we can make it look uh, perfect. So typically what we do, we work off a of photo if we have dimensions, but um, a lot of times we'll take CAD, right? So 3D, uh, when I worked at Autodesk, you know, there's maturity that has sort of spread in, in adoption of 3D technology along, along different industry segments. So automotive and aerospace, well, they, they had CAD uh, long before personal computers, right? And so what PCs did and even Autodesk with AutoCAD was democratize that for a lot of people. And then you know, now everyone could do AutoCAD. Um, but then over time, uh, that evolved to three-dimensional design. So now in architecture, if you're designing a commercial building, it's done in something called Revit. In the, in the U.S., they have a, a ton of market share. Um, if you're designing a computer mouse, you're, well, you might be using a comp competing product, uh, but you're probably designing it in 3D and doing rapid prototyping and 3D printing even uh, actually existed a long time ago. Um, so those technologies essentially are now just becoming mainstream and you could have a startup and you can design your, your, your product in 3D and, and now obviously rapid prototype. Um, but it's that, that design file, that 3D design file that we'll take, whether it's a high chair, a stroller, and it's designed in 3D. The dimensions are perfect from every angle. 
but those applications don't really show reflections and surfaces and stitching and things like that very well. So what we do most of the time with the best success is just take those assets and repurpose them into the visual uh, platform like 3D Studio Max or Maya or these platforms that are meant for really stunning visuals. Uh, and then we either shoot uh, virtual photons at them, uh, which basically create a render, like a still frame, um, or we can put it into a, a game engine sort of thing and you know, allow for a greater amount of, of, of uh, interactivity. Yeah, that was the thing that I found so interesting in that prior in that computer vision episode that we did was, you know, and and Joel, he kind of opened my eyes to that. He said, well, look, if you look at your wall, there's actually like 10 different shades. And it just depends. Like it's where does the light hit it? It's darker up in the corners. And those are the things that now, once again, man, I, I go to go to 3D source dot com. I'm looking at your demos right now while you're talking. I'm sorry. I should be paying yeah. attention. But well, I'll give you this the is really cool stuff. I'm like, I'm, basically, I'm, page. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> well, I'm just I'm designing a three a stroller right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I figured with Matt Watson having a baby right now, this might be a worthwhile task. But but yeah, no, that's... this is this is really cool. So so, you know, back to your business and the model with this. All right. So let's just say I'm a retailer and I have a uh, I have a 200 asset catalog, you know, how do I go? Like, how does this, how does this work? Like, so do you, yeah. you mentioned that you need, you, you use a designer, but is some of, I, I'm assuming that some of this is, is proprietary technology or is this about the steps or the, the it's, templates it's or all of the above, you know, and, and 3d is a, it's a medium. And uh, so people can try it and fail, you know, just like trying to paint your own sign for your business, you know, um, hiring an expert versus doing it yourself, you know. So, um, you know, it, it's all of the above. So it's using the right technology. It's having experts. And we have some generalists, but also a lot of specialists um, using the right for file formats and kind of demystifying that for retail brands so they understand what it is they're buying, it's not throw away, it has kind of a long tail value. And ultimately what we do is provide kind of a, a 3D strategy first, right? Because things like AR and VR are buzzwords, you've heard them, you've probably tried it. Uh, in, and for entertainment and for, uh, for certain uh, space planning tools, they're pretty interesting. But for selling a product, not so much. And yet, if you're a retailer, you're going to get hounded with all kinds of people saying, do AR, do VR. Um, and we don't know that that's the best approach yet. So what we do is say, let's build a 3D strategy. Let's figure out how you leverage 3D uh, internally. And it's typically just going and finding all of their CAD models um, and putting great materials on them that reflect light, refract light properly when you shoot virtual photons at them and then figure out an interactive Wait, experience. Hang on, on hang on, hang on. What's uh, a virtual proton? Oh, a photon. It's a light. Photon. Yeah, photon. Yeah. Oh, boy. What, is, what, is, what is that? Well, so rendering, right? You look at Pixar. Um, okay. Pixar, uh, you know, it's, it's basically that movie exists in a computer over, over the bay from me in Emeryville, any, any Pixar movie. And then they send it to a what's called a render farm. And it basically takes all of that computer code that the artists had spent time on and shoots these virtual photons at uh, from a virtual camera to the virtual model. And it hits that and says, okay, what does the code of this model say it sh I should do with this light? What color should I turn that pixel, right? Is it, is it a reflection? Is it, is it bouncing back a color, right? So that's 3D rendering uh, in a nutshell, but they're doing it thousands or billions of times for every single pixel of a Pixar frame, right? And we're doing the same thing. We're just doing it on a small scale for someone's product, but that is how you get photorealism. Uh, that's how you get like that variation, like you said, uh, that if you look at, uh, there's a good example online from a guy who, who talks about photorealism. You pull out like a chocolate bar from the wrapper and it's, you think it's brown. Well, it's got ice on it that's reflecting the light uh, it's blue, it's purple, it's got all kinds of different things on it. And that's realism. <clears throat> Humans are really good at, at, at looking at that and saying it's not real, so much so that Pixar films are typically stylized to not look like realism uh, because you get that effect of something called the uncanny valley. Have you heard of that before? I have not. 
I'm so, way out know, of my depth here today, Tom. No, no. The uncanny, uncanny valley is is this biological <laughs> thing that happens when you look at. You probably saw like the last Star Wars where they simulated uh, Luke and Leia uh, as as young Jedi after the, the the I guess Return of the Jedi. And you look at that, you're like, it doesn't look real. Like you can see it right away, right? And it's because the humans are really good at picking out when when an image of a human is fake or altered or just wrong somehow. And so that's the uncanny valley is, um, is that distance between reality and, um, and, and that sort of simulation that just feels wrong. And it, it's, it hits our biology because I think it's like, do not meet with that when it <laughs> comes with a human. Um, so that's sort of a fascinating sidetrack. But um, for anything else, a car, uh, you know, a sofa, a, a high chair, we can, we can reach complete photorealism and you will not know the difference, right? So, but it all happens through this process of building a model and then either putting it in a game engine um, or throwing those virtual photons called rendering at it to produce an image and take it from there. Okay, so now back to my, my, my fake retail store yeah. with my 200 asset catalog and I, I've called 3D source and I'm like, Tom, I need to get this stuff online. People keep ordering my products, but because they don't get an idea of what they look like, they keep sending them back. I'm assuming that's one of the problems that you solve for retailers is Absolutely. Help, helping people get a better idea of what they're getting. And, you know, like I said, I, I've, the only thing I have to reference this from was, you know, paint. Uh, and, you know, mentioning like, cause it'll look different and, and look at your own wall right now. Like there's, if there's a shadow on it, it looks dark. If there's light on it, it looks light. And so maybe I don't get that full idea of what it looks like. Um, what other kinds of now, you know, if you've listened to the podcast long enough, you've also heard me say that you got to look like you're in the business of doing whatever it is. It's you say you do. So if you're selling a product and you have shitty photographs, well, you shouldn't be too surprised when they don't sell well. So I'm assuming that this will help increase sales. It could also cut down on returns. What are some other things that you'll help my store do? Yeah. So I mean, you, those are the two main ones, right? You help your sales. Somebody buys more confidently, um, uh, reduce returns, right? Which is very, very costly. Um, uh, yeah, I think in terms of conversion rates, we rarely see anything less than double digit uh, conversion uh, lifts when somebody does a, a 3D configurator uh, because it, it's fun. I mean, people also engagement, people spend 16, 20 minutes just playing with it, just like you're doing. And you're, you know, now you're thinking about buying a baby stroller. I mean, they're fun to play. No, with. I, I've, I've moved on. I'm designing a laundry room now. And this oh, one looks nice. way nicer than my own. So I might have to build a new house to go. <laughs> my, my, uh, my eight year old son, Quinn has been designing things like that since he was five years old. So part of what we're also doing is making the user interface is just dead simple. So that literally a child, uh, can do it. And, you know, that's a big barrier as well, right? Salespeople, consumers, uh, it's really easy to make software that, you know, pack another button in the top and add another section to your YouTube training that hopefully someone watches. It's really hard to make software that's intuitive and, and really, right. especially for a sales process, it's walk up, start interacting like you're doing, uh, and also be impressed with the visuals. So, okay. Yeah. So now, now with, so you're going to help me sell more. You're going to uh, hopefully reduce my marketing costs. Cause I'm going to have a higher, I'm going to have a higher conversion rate. Now this 3d source. And for those listening, go to 3d source.com. Check it out. It's really cool stuff. Do you also, are you also going to, does your tech integrate into my website? So am I also like getting the, the turnkey stuff that's going to make my going to make my demos on my site look as cool as they look at 3dsource.com. Yeah, you bet. So uh, there's examples on there of a, a handbag company. You start off with a white handbag with a bunch of different panels of uh, of leather that you can customize, different types of leather, colors of leather, spin it around, see it in not that kind of cartoonish 3D uh, model looking view, but actually look every every angle looks like a photograph. And then, yes, in that case, you can put it in the shopping cart and your version will show up as a nice little thumbnail that travels all the, all the way along uh, through the sale. So we can integrate 
into e-commerce, into CRM for more of like an enterprise sale. And we can also pull data from ERP systems. So, you know, if you're a big company like uh, like Stoka, who makes the, the, the high chair that we're looking at, when they have a new SKU, a new color, or something like that, we can integrate on the front end so that they don't have to pick up the phone and get another kind of task order with us. We're just sort of a partner and part of the process uh, that, that we know once something's reached a, we are going to make this and, and market it and manufacture it. Um, we get the flag directly from that system to start building the 3D version of it, whether it be a color, material, or object. And uh, they can often market that product before they've ever produced one in the factory. Yeah, this is cool stuff. So uh, what industries are the best at using this right now? And which ones could, in your opinion, really stand to use it a lot more? Yeah, um, automotive is really advanced. Almost everyone has done a 3D car configurator, right? You've picked the uh, the paint color and the, the interior color and played around with some of that. And often it will spin. And we're doing some of the same things. And the price point on a car makes sense to invest in, in sort of uh, things like that. So a lot of what we do, we've done is bring the, 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 uh, the cost to produce these sorts of things down into markets like furniture, um, like housewares, um, almost anything, maybe sporting goods, things like that, uh, to make it cost effective compared to photography. And so furniture has a long way to go. Um, Wayfair is doing a lot. Um, Amazon and Target are doing a lot around that to kind of push towards 3D, largely for this kind of AR thing, which I mentioned is emerging, will be good, uh, but kind of limited uh, for now. Uh, but furniture has a long way to go. Um, almost anything. I mean, the other, other thing we work in is uh, consumer packaged goods, CP, uh, CPG. And, and during COVID, I mean, a lot more people than previously, I'm sure, have ordered from the grocery store uh, online. Like, I, we've got Safeway out here. But boy, it's limiting. You know, when you don't see that you're grabbing, uh, when you're grabbing, this is my Midwest showing, I bought those French fried onions. Yeah, you put on the uh, Thanksgiving, the, the, uh, the green bean casserole. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm the only person buying that in California. But I bought I bought one of those online on, on Safeway and I had no idea the size. So I got this tiny little thing of it and because I, I just saw a picture and I didn't have the relative size of it standing uh, in front of me on a shelf or next to other sizes, right? So this is another example of where we can help out by visualizing other sizes or have a soda can or a milk jug right behind it that's sort of just representational and elevate those experiences so that, again, intuitively, there's not a button to press, but you just look at that image, you say, okay, I get the sense of what I'm buying here. And it's a lot of psychology, right? It's a lot of like, how do we get someone thinking about, you know, visualizing what that product is and also doing things like visualizing how it might look in my space. So like your laundry configurator, getting it to look, you know, catalog images are great, but there's often many things that are not like the space that you're thinking about putting it in. So what if you could just, with one finger, tap around, change the wall color, change the rug, um, you know, uh, change the, the wood uh, of the molding to dark or light and match it and get it closer. Well, psychologically, you're getting someone closer to visualizing your product in their space. And that's, you know, that accelerates uh, sales. You know, you don't have to do a whole psychological study to see how impactful that would be um, yeah, so that's, that's what it's about. It ends up being psychology. You know, one of our, one of our regular guests, Andrew Morgans, who runs an Amazon brand accelerator is, you know, we've spent so much time talking about, you know, like one of the things that they get a lot of clients, new clients that come in and, you know, he'll tell a client, they'll say, we got to redo all of your product images. And they're like, why? They're great. And they're mm -hmm. terrible. They're like yeah. really terrible, you know, or they'll have two of them. And, you know, like I look at the soundboard that my microphone is plugged into. I wanted to buy a different one, but it didn't have a picture of all the different angles and I needed to see what the back looked like. And I ended up buying the one that I have now, which works just fine and is great, but I literally was ready to buy a different product, but because I couldn't see the back of it, I was like, shit, I didn't know. I wanted to, I, before I had it, I hate returning things. I like literally have a room full of shit that I 
that I bought that I didn't like, didn't want, didn't need, or something happened. And I just suck at returning stuff. It's kind of a joke around my house, but that's like, that's me. So when I saw the back of it, I needed to see it had the specific type of USB output and it made a huge difference for me. Now, I, when I look at your site and I see that these images and this stuff is in 8K and, you know, if we know that half of people on the web are now buying stuff through mobile phones, is that a challenge? No, no, because, I mean, uh, mobile phones are 8K and, and part of ours is you can zoom in, right? So we okay. know, our, our images, we can put an 8K image up there and you can zoom in and see all of that data. So 3D is a perfect solution for that because people... <laughs> People need to see all of those different angles. They want to see what's on the back. Um, yeah, the, the big retailers need to up their game. They're aware of this. Um, and they're actually pushing to 3D. You, know, you, you mentioned retailer as your example, but it, there's this interesting tension between retailers and manufacturers, right? Amazon sells, I don't know how many millions of products. Uh, same with Wayfair, same with Target. Well, what they love and what they're moving towards, and they've been somewhat public about this, is they've built a consortium to say, hey, manufacturer, we're going to stop asking you for photos for your product page that you're selling, uh, where you're selling your product. We're going to ask for a 3D model. And here are the specifications on it. And so that we can create an, a, um, an experience that when a consumer scrolls through the page of uh, products from different brands, it looks completely consistent, right? So that's one of the goals they have. I mean, just compare, you know, even Amazon uh, to, you know, uh, or eBay or something like that to Target or restoration hardware, right, where everything has been dialed in perfectly. Um, but then to your point, being able to spin it around, zoom in and really get a feel and an understanding for that product uh, is, is critically important. And we're all seeing that two, three images at 500K, uh, you know, 500 by 500K, uh, resolution is just not enough to understand what is what. So is that the biggest, is that the hardest thing with all this is the consistency? Like you mentioned, like having, you know, this battle between the manufacturer and the retailer, which seems weird. Cause like, you know, I used to work for Roland, uh, world's mm -hmm. largest maker of uh, electronic musical instruments. And they were really adamant about, they had all kinds of pictures. It was always done real well. And, you know, we provided those to all of our distributors and dealers. And that was also a long time ago. Um, well, the, but, what's, you, what's you know, happened? With, with that, that was, that was why we did it. Cause yeah. it's not possible to stock everything with the, and, and by the way, this is like, this is really important stuff for the future of retail. Cause is that, what is the future of retail? Like that is very exactly. questionable right now. Retail was already on the ropes prior to coronavirus. Now it's like, shit, what's a retail store. Exactly. I live in my house. I live in my house now. I don't come out. So, <laughs> so with that, this guy, I mean, an accurate and, and reasonable view, by the way, one of the things that I, a lot of people don't, there is a metric that is very difficult to calculate and that's your opportunity costs and the opportunity cost in missing a sale. And you don't ever really know why you talk, you listen, listen to what Tom's saying here and go, go to 3dsource.com and check out the, how beautifully they have this stuff laid out. But you, there's a psychology and in, in, that goes behind why people buy stuff. And it's very difficult to determine why they don't. Sometimes it's, it's easy to, once they purchase it, you can actually often ask them, why did you buy this? But it's right. the people, you know, it's harder to get your arms around, you know, why people didn't. So right. and there's, there's a, there are a lot of soft benefits in this. So we, you know, we have some hard ROI we can show, but you know, most CEOs have something in their hit list of customer experience, right? Uh, things that improve the brand and doing something like this, you may, not, may or may not see it right away, but repeat customer comes back and you know, they're like, well, I want that buying experience, right? Like uh, if you're a shoe guy, I mean, Zappos does it pretty well, right? Like they have a video, they, they really show you more than what Nordstrom uh, or, uh, or Amazon is showing with a few images, right? So you get that sort of brand identity going. Um, we're the people who really provide a good experience for you. Um, and that's, that's incredibly meaningful, especially going into COVID where that, that shift to e-commerce is going to uh, increase even greater. But to your right. Roland point, um, I, I mean, I think that uh, I think the burden we've heard from manufacturers is, boy, uh, all of these different uh, channels I'm selling through want different photo specs and things like that. And it, it becomes burdensome and some overhead for them to manage like, well, 
these guys want this resolution. They want this background. They want um, you know, something like this, again, to try and create that consistency when they're selling on their uh, web property. And 3D is, the, is, like I said, the key to that. So uh, they, they believe in the future, they're going to just ask for a 3D model. The retailer will shoot the, uh, the renders themselves to spec and then create that consistency. But they also know, boy, if we don't have our act together on asking for what file type or um, how detailed the model should be or anything like that, we're actually creating a problem for our suppliers because there's no way they'll be able to catch up because they're only partially succeeding on the photography side of things today. So we're in the sort of transition stage between manufacturers and retailers in terms of who pays for this development and what standards they should use and so on. So that's a big part of what like what we do is advise a manufacturer or a retailer to try and just understand that landscape and not make some obvious bad decisions uh, as they either re make requests of their suppliers or uh, create models that they think will be uh, acceptable for retailers. By the way, you mentioned the number of products that were on Amazon. That's 353 million. Wow, it's incredible. <sighs> I mean, 12 million well, of which Amazon sells themselves. So the rest of them are the sellers. But you look at like, I mean, and now think about that. Can you even conceptualize 353 million of anything? And yeah, I mean, that's that's just like an insane number. And, and then if you, each of those has uh, five product images, now we're in the billions. And well, it's it's a lot to take in. It is, but this is actually the world that I live in because, you know, that high chair, I'd have to run the numbers, uh, but that high chair alone, I don't know if it gets into the millions, but it's in something in the order of four or 500,000 different unique SKUs, right? Because once, when you say you can have a different, all these accessories, wood grain, uh, wood, wood types, uh, colors, then the accessories on it, the accessories come in different colors, the upholstery. Uh, accessories can swap out different colors. It's a it's a multiplication, right? It's exponential uh, sort of multiplication to come up with how many unique uh, variations there are. And so, you know, we have products or at least scenes that are in the trillions of possible combinations that you could come up with. But that's you know that's who a manufacturer wants to be is saying, look, we want to make it fit you. Right. So um, and we can and we offer these things, but how and how we cannot possibly manufacture the, all these options and photograph you know, even one percent of that. Right. It, it makes no sense. So 3D is the obvious choice on things that are configurable cars, you know, high chairs, things with lots of different options. But even if it doesn't change, I mean, every company is going to have a 3D model library of their individual product SKUs uh, within the next few years, guaranteed, because. If they're not, if they haven't just clued in that it saves money in photography and marketing and creating some quick uh, uh, social media content, things like that, um, someone else that they're selling through will ask for it. Well, that's the challenge that retails, retailers and manufacturers share is what to stock, what to build, how many to build of them. And, you know, I mean, it's just like, it doesn't matter who you are, or what you manufacture, you're going to be wrong. Yeah. And certain times and, you know, that uh, it, it, on the flip side of that, it's sometimes difficult to make things and get them to people within the time frames that they expect them. So, right. you know, that's kind of a, an interesting challenge. All right. So once again, with us today, we have Tom Connor, co-founder of 3D Source out, out in the valley. So, San Francisco, yeah. Yeah, I haven't. It's been about six months since I've been out there. I'm not sure when they'll let me get back. I might have to look at a 3D rendering or something like that. Maybe 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 we'll do TechCrunch this year, just in a, a rendered fashion. Fantastic. Well, I'll save me a, save me a, save me a little time, effort, and energy. Yeah, um, I'd have to probably, be a, a probably physical, money physical or or virtual host for that for sure. So, you know, as we kind of round out this episode of Start a Puzzle, was once again brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software development team quickly and affordably. Um, so I'm tired of hearing during these challenging times. Yeah. I have to think that a lot of uh, that your customer inquiries have gone up in the they last have. couple of months. Is that true? Yes. So like everyone, I think everything was on pause for a few weeks, uh, sure. but like what's going on? How bad is this? But all of a sudden, um, 
yeah, it's been it's been incredible. So we have uh, Fortune, well, I won't say uh, what level of Fortune 500, but very very small number of uh, Fortune companies who are finally figuring out that 3D is the way to go. Um, lots of little manufacturers, and and uh, so we're seeing a big bump from this. And also, you know, we do a lot of stuff in. Um, we have a mobile building company. I think there's a demo going up soon uh, called Mobile Modular. And you know, they're now looking at their spaces that they uh, they deploy and, and rent uh, and lease furniture for to say, well, now we need to reconfigure those spaces. So having that kind of space planning capability uh, for how we separate workers and things like that, 3D can help you visualize that sort of thing in advance, rough it out before you start making big changes uh, to your space. So just, I mean, 3D, like I mentioned before, it's a medium, so all kinds of things you can do with it. And what you need to find is a partner. Um, I think we're a great one <laughs> for navigating that, understanding what it is. I mean, we can create the entire world in 3D to perfect detail, microscopic detail. Um, that is possible with enough time and money. Um, the challenge is to, you know, is to build it and, and create an experience that comes through on your smartphone or on a screen of how you want to interact with what is the story you're trying to tell and how do you want to bring it to life and get it into somebody's head that, okay, now I understand that product, although I've not seen it uh, in person. Okay, so last question for Tom Conard, co-founder of 3D Source. What's some advice you could give to a startup founder that wants to do any of this? <laughs> Well, um, it would be great. I mean, we, we love uh, when other companies are in this space. I think it, it, we spend a lot of time, maybe too much time, educating people on 3D. And I appreciate the, the time here today to uh, spread the word and, and get it out there. But um, there's, going to be, there's going to be a gap in, uh, in the type of people who can create this stuff. So if you're listening to this and you're like, what's a good market to get into? Um, if you're living somewhere where the cost of living is not uh, excessive and you have a knack for developing 3D models or textures or any of that, that is going to be a job that will exist for a long time. Um, for organizing those people, project managing those people, that's an excellent role and a, a needed uh, role that, that we will continue to uh, add and grow. Um, and if you're a manufacturer or retailer, um, you know, Get some advice, learn about the space before you think we need an AR tool. We need to put our products in AR or VR. Um, we're delving into things like virtual photography so that once you have these 3D models, a marketing person can do something with it and you know, pull it up on screen, rotate it, get an 8K shot on demand for social media content, other things um, without having to fire up a photo studio. Which, and we were building that, we, we've got a version of it running now it's even more valuable now where uh, photo studios and human contact and uh, all of that are uh, less accessible. So um, other than that, I mean, I think the broader thing, like career-wise, going back to my time at Autodesk is you know, if you're in a big company and you, I, I think you see the gaps that uh, it's not the right fit. I mean, Autodesk makes software that people use to create stuff. So it, was, it will never be a good fit for them to do provide directly what we provide, but you, you see those sort of opportunities um, within certain roles. And in my case, what I did was say, I think I, I, think I know enough about it and I, can, I am an expert in it and, and the market needs it. And we dove in with that knowledge and just be confident in identifying those gaps and uh, see what you can do and, and build from it, whether it's in 3D or, or anything. Once again with us today, Tom Conard, co-founder of 3D Source. You can find more info about 3D Source at 3dsource.com. I'm going to close this episode by saying, look, if you sell a product, you need to get this kind of stuff moving because this is the norm. It's going to be, and there's really no way around it. And, you know, kind of like Tom said, there's, there's a little bit to, you got to kind of wrap your arms around some of this. Uh, we've talked a lot in the past about buy versus build. This is not something if you want to buy this, not try to build it yourself. Um, this is the kind of stuff that is, is really, you know, kind of, like I said, the, the, we said earlier, the future of retail, uh, manufacturing, home building, a lot of different stuff. I just see like, there's really kind of unlimited applications for this kind of stuff. Uh, but overall, it's like, 
I mean, it, you're going to get to the point if you're not doing this, then you're, you're the dinosaur, you're Kmart, you're JC Penny or whoever, <laughs> whoever's going out of business right now, you know, yeah. and it's, it's, it, I've heard people say, they're like, man, where did Amazon come from? I'm like 20 years of hard work. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of that was, you know, so much about what has made them a web giant is making it easy for people to buy stuff. And I, I didn't pretend to be an expert on 3D or virtual photons or anything <laughs> like that today, but I do know a couple of things about selling stuff and you got to make it easy for people to do it. And you know, if you have a lot of different, if you have a lot of different products, you have a lot of different SKUs. You mentioned uh, the variables that come with that. It gets very difficult to represent all of that and keep it updated and a whole lot. So, you know, stuff like this is really, is really the key to, to future product sales as well as anything custom. So speaking of custom, I'm going to get back to customizing my own life. See you next time.